and welcome to your Saturday morning wake-up call right here on 95, excuse me, on uh, KFAR. We are 660 on your AM dial. I am Steve Floyd, the monkey behind the machine, and uh, joining me in the studio this morning from uh, Bighorn Enterprises, we have Josh Bennett. Good morning, Josh. Good morning. And from Far North Tactical, we have Aaron Bennett. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning. All right. We've got the microphones hot and ready. And the phone lines are open at 458-TALK, 458-8255. Gentlemen, what is on the docket this morning? We want to talk about presidents, I believe. Well, we don't really want to because they're talked about enough. Dead presidents? like Ones like George Newt Washington Gingrich. Or, oh, <laughs> once and future president. Ex- okay. Wait. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, they're actually not presidents as in individuals of themselves, but the office of the presidency and the corruptness of the office of the presidency. Whoa, whoa, whoa. The corruptness of the office. Now, I've always been taught to show respect to the office of the president. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. We have come to that point to where we love and show fealty to this presidency. Um, the majesty of the presidency is what it's come to. And uh, I was reading a really good um, article. It was a speech given by Lou Rockwell, and it was called Down with the Presidency. And it's really good. I'm going to read a few uh, things from it but right now. Oh, yeah, I will right now. It starts. It doesn't start off, but one of the things that I thought was great about it says, The president, presidency can plow up a religious community in Texas and bury its members because they got on someone's nerves at the Justice Department. The presidency can tap our phones, read our mail, watch our bank accounts, and tell us what we can and cannot eat, drink, and smoke. The presidency can break up businesses, shut down airlines, void void drilling leases, bribe foreign heads of state, arrest them, try them in kangaroo courts, nationalize land, engage in germ warfare, firebomb crops in Colombia, overthrow any government anywhere, erect tariffs, round up and discredit any public or private assembly it chooses, grab our guns, tax our incomes and our inheritances, steal our land, centrally plan the national world economy, and impose embargoes on anything at any time. No prince or pope ever had this ability. Where can I sign up? Yeah. Well, that's what we teach our kids. When you grow up, you too someday could be the president and have all the power in the world. You know, that's another thing he says in here where teachers teach the children, any and everyone could be the president. He said that's actually a threat. It's the same as anyone can go to hell. <laughs> Look at wow. uh, okay. Lincoln. Um, Lincoln was a mass murderer, military dictator. But that's, uh, he said something about him. His term was a model of every despot's dream, spending money without congressional approval, declaring martial law, arbitrarily arresting thousands and holding them without trial, suppressing free speech in the free press, handing out lucrative war of contracts to his cronies, raising taxes, inflating the currency, killing hundreds of thousands for the crime of desiring self-government. Somebody just get... We have today, everyone... Lincoln's the reason Posse Comitatus happened. Yeah. For somebody who's not familiar with Posse Comitatus, what does that mean? Yeah, you start be speaking in these Latin phraseologies. <laughs> what is Posse Comitatus in simple English the language? The government may not use the military on Americans. So in other words, we are not ever to expect to see actual American soldiers in the streets... What, what, okay, I, I, I'm, I'm familiar with that I, that concept, but what happened in Katrina? They used they broke posse comitatus. So, but who did that? I mean, was that the the federal government that did that? Office of the presidency. The, the pre- George Bush, to be uh, specific. The office. The president is called the leader of the world's only superpower, the world's indispensable nation, which is reason enough to have him deposed. I think that's great. We have the early, uh, early on, the anti-federalists were completely against having a executive branch of the government, and the reason was because they knew he would turn into this today. And originally, if we look back, we never were supposed to vote for the president because we got, we ended up getting what we have now. Since we get to vote for him, they get to spend what a billion dollars, I think, this year. It's going to be spent to get the new president. 
a billion dollars in advertising. Originally, it was they were uh, not supposed to be. The state legislators had electorates who voted on who they wanted to be president, and if he got a majority over 50%, then he got to be president. And then if that didn't work, if there wasn't enough votes for one person, then five and later three of the chosen people went to the Congress, and Congress decided who was going to be president, which made the president under and responsible to the Congress, which is exactly opposite of today. They're completely, they're not bound by Congress at all now because they don't get their power from Congress anymore. They get it from us, supposedly. And going back on to the, uh, everyone's busy here. Going back on to uh, <laughs> the Office of the Presidency and us giving them so much uh, love and respect for the office. I went back to look at some of the things that John Jay wrote about sovereignty, right? the I think it was Hamilton wanted Washington to be called His Majesty. They basically wanted to have... I thought it was Adams that wanted that. Was it Adams? Yeah. But the Anti-Federalists, they weren't really worried about the man itself. It was just like the king. They weren't really worried about the king. It was the office of the king that they feared because he was a tyrant the office was the tyranny it didn't matter who came in just like now for the last hundred years does it matter who gets in or is it the office itself that's destroying us but just so let's think get back to uh who these people are the president should we show them respect and john jay who was the first supreme court justice of the united states and actually, most of the writing of the Constitution came from him. It said, Sovereignty is the right to govern. A nation or state sovereign is the person or persons in whom they reside. In Europe, the sovereignty is generally ascribed to the prince. Here it rests with the people. There the sovereign actually administers the government. Here, never in a single instance. Our governors are agents of the people, and at most stand in the same relation to their sovereign, the people in which the regents in Europe stand to their sovereigns. Their princes have personal powers, dignities, and preeminences. Our rulers have none but official, nor do they partake in any sovereignty otherwise, or in any other capacity, but as a private citizen. So these guys, the President of the United States should not be something that we, for one, respect, because it destroys our liberties daily. The presidency is destroying our liberties. And it's not something we should be so worked up to get our guy in. Because it doesn't matter. It's the office itself that is corrupt. It's completely taken over the entire United States government. When you think federal government, who do you think of? The president, of course. Barack Obama or George Bush. Anyways. Uh, or Newt Gingrich. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it seems to me that it's not so much the president, though, that has done this. Isn't it the Congress that has given the president the powers? Isn't it the Congress that has abdicated their constitutionally mandated powers? I mean, you look at, for instance, the Declaration of War. I, you could not get a Declaration of War out of the Congress right now to save our lives. We, They would be out there, I think it would be easier for us to get a declaration of surrender, an unconditional surrender out of our Congress than you could a declaration of war. But they'll approve military action. They'll they'll, they'll fund any any kind of military action around the world, but, and they'll they'll give the blessing after the president has ordered it. But to, to think that somehow a standard should be raised up that the Congress would actually declare war, that's never going to happen again. Because we've gotten a whole bunch of panty wastes into office who now have declined to take any stand on any issue and just stand in the shadow of the president. And that happens on both parties. Yeah. Am I, am I, am I right? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> um, so, I, I mean, but to, to, to go back and blame the, the office of the presidency on that, I, I, I really think, I mean, I mean they, were, they were trying to do that all the way back to George Washington. Right. There were people in the Congress way back in George Washington's times that were trying to get him to be the king, and he refused. He said, "No, no, no, no." I mean, the problem has to has to. I mean, you have to put blame where it lies, and I I really think that the blame lies in the people that we've elected to Congress. Well, ultimately, it lies with us, right? If we're the exactly but exactly to 
Hamilton, the way that Hamilton actually got the presidency to be accepted by con- by the anti-federalist, I guess, was that uh, he wrote something <laughs> wrote something in the anti-federalist papers about Congress having the right to impeach the president, which is really what gave them kind of threw them off a little bit and said, okay, well, maybe we can do that. As long as Congress has a authority to impeach, then great. Let's impeach him. And originally, he was constantly supposed to be worried about impeachment, every little thing, which, of course, we see now never happens, ever. But the... Uh, <sighs> Are you gonna see you over there playing the whole thing? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still. I'm, I'm trying to wrap my mind around this. I, the idea that somehow you're not supposed to respect the office. I mean, I can get not respecting the person, but not, not putting a lot of uh, stock in whoever happens to be the president, and not bowing to them, not curtsying when they walk by, not saying your Majesty. Okay, I get that, but. Uh, what about the, this concept that you are supposed to respect the office? I mean, where did that come from? And if we're not supposed to respect the the office of the presidency, what does that lead to? Doesn't doesn't that end up leading to freedom uh, and liberty? Oh, oh, oh. If we're the sovereigns, I mean, it's just like take the little borough building over there. What do we do? We go over there, and everyone says, "You need to come to the borough building so we can kowtow and bow down to these people." And say, please give us this, please give us that. And we show them all this undue respect. As human beings and as citizens, they deserve our respect. Outside of that, absolutely not. Why should we kowtow to them? We should be going in there and say, do what we want now. Which, do what we want in a democratic society isn't always the right thing, is it? A good example, that's when um, you could pull from the Bible and the Israelites were begging for a king. Yeah, and what did the <laughs> and God said it directly because they begged for a king that they re- get what they wanted. That's right, <laughs> and they did. Taxes, wars. He'll take your sons. He'll take your lands. You've rejected me. Anyway, when we last week we had someone call us up and ask uh, what. What things can we do, basically? Quit whining and complaining and tell us some things that we can do. Well, here's something we can start out with. Quit living like a bunch of serfs. Quit acting like these people own us and tell us what and can tell us what to do and that there are gods, that there are sovereigns. They get in this little seat over there and they sit up there. I like how they sit above the rest of us and we go to go sit in a little chair in front of isn't, them. But isn't that, again, part of our own making? I mean, isn't it the people in the borough that, that have made the borough assembly what they are? Right, he was talking about the solution. Quit living like serfs. Demand respect from them, not the other way around. We've so, got it totally opposite because we respect these people. I and mean, when the president walks down, they get a little fanfare. Dun, 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 and everyone bows and throws flowers and lays out the red carpet and get the palm leaves out and set it down for his donkey to go down the aisle. <laughs> and it's exactly opposite. We should not care. Who the, Ladies you know, and gentlemen, das Führer. The people, when it's a Republican, he rides the elephant, not a donkey. <laughs> no, uh, right. Originally, though, the people, during during the after the revolution, literally, people had no thought of who the president was. They could care less because he was not supposed to have this power. And the reason that he does is because we've allowed it. And we allow it at the very basic at home, right across the river here at the borough, the same thing. We give these people undue respect. They don't deserve it. They were never supposed to have it. Like I said, respect them as humans and as citizens, but as far as their office, no. You don't respect that office at all. Shall we go to the phones? Sure. 458 Talk is a number. All right, they didn't know. How about that? <laughs> I you must have been an assemblyman. Well, okay. Now, I, I, when you go over to the assembly meeting I, and, and you have your allotted three minutes to testify, unless they decide to ask you questions, in which case you can have the floor for as long as they are asking you questions. I mean, it is very much a power structure set up to keep the borough assembly members in control of the conversation and to keep them in control of the situation and to keep you in your place. 
Yeah, and, and, I mean, how would how would how would you possibly change that without getting tossed out of the meeting? I mean, you couldn't. I mean, you you all you'd end up doing is basically being accused of disrupting the meeting, and you would be forcibly removed. Then maybe that's what needs to be happening. Maybe you need to be forcibly removed for disrupting. It's not right what goes on over there, so why do we go along with it? Because that's just the way it is. And we're worried about our time preferences having something happen immediately, right? We want change now. We want change now. Well, maybe we need to start changing our attitude towards these elective representatives. And if we did that and got more people to change their mind and more people to change the way they treat them, eventually, down the road, generations from now, we might get back to the way it should have been. 200 years ago, the way it started off 200 years ago and advanced from 200 years ago. You know, it reminds you of when you watch uh, an old movie with a king sitting in his throne, right? And the subject comes in, the king lowers his wand, and then the subject gets to walk up and he bows on one knee over here. I mean, and the king's sitting up like, what, five or six steps above the subject, and over here at the borough building we come in and we, we don't bow to see... Give us your name and your address, peasant. And so you say, my name's Josh Bennett, and I live at blah, blah, blah. And so proceed with what you would like to tell us. So you go off, and you get your little three minutes, and then you're done. Your time is up, slave. Go back and sit down. They don't have to answer you. They don't have to ask you a question. You cannot ask them questions. I think that's the biggest crock of all. Who are they that we can't ask them questions? Seriously, in front of everyone, yeah. give account. If you're going to hold them to account, then they should be given account to that surf right on the spot. If someone wants to ask them a question, they should be able to ask them a question with the whole room full of people and give account for what they've done. If I hire someone, I don't let them, I don't go in and ask them, would you please go and do your job? I don't do that. If I hire someone, I don't go into, I wouldn't go into their office and he's sitting up on a stool and I get down on a knee and say, could I have three minutes of your time, please? Okay. Well, first of all, tell me who you are. Uh, I'm your boss. <laughs> no, you go in there and you say, hey, buddy, you're my slave. Do what I say now. And if you don't, boot. Give account for what you've done. How and if you, I want to have 50 account? people in there listening to it, I can do that, too. How do you account for the fact that not everybody agrees with um, what you want them to do? In what way? Well, you just said go in there and tell them. Oh, yeah. I don't care if people... I mean, I'm not... I'm getting off the road there with mm-hmm. democracy a little bit, huh? I guess you don't necessarily go in there and say, do what I say, give me what I want. That That's the biggest problem if we go in there like the serfs and say, give me my, give me my grain, give me my grain. Yeah. When actually their only job over there... Actually, well, I don't even know what, why we have them. Well, the, the, the main purpose of the borough, according to the state, is to tax the people. <laughs> that is the main purpose of the borough. It is a mechanism by which we are to get our taxes taken from us to pay for the things that we want. Then we should whether it is it. Whether it is a... We did! Back in 1964 or whenever the, 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 the borough first came up for a vote, the people of Fairbanks said no. And then, guess what happened? They usurped that and forced it. The state said, no, you shall have a borough. And then the people of Fairbanks said, well, I guess as long as we have to have it, we may as well have elections and decides who's going to run this thing that the that the state says we have to have. Yeah, there was a mistake right there that Fairbanks but, made. But uh, I mean, right you're going back over 40, what, like 45 years here we to talk have. about something, have. a mistake that was made in the, in the fact of going along with it. But even then, what do you do? You've got uh, 1967, the flood hit, and people were uh, wiped out, and they got assistance, federal assistance, from Uncle Sam. Sure. Let's go ahead and nestle up to the TD, because you're going to be getting your your federal funds to rebuild. You're going to be getting your federal emergency funds. Who could, who's going to who's going to administer that? Well, obviously, the borough did. I mean, and it all comes back to money. It comes back to the flow of money from the feds. The flow of money to the state from the people. I mean, it's all about taxation and redistribution of funds. It's all about our attitude towards government. It really comes down to that. Our attitude is that we are their serfs. We're we are subjects to a central government or a national government. 
We are serfs to a state who says you will have a borough. What? Right there, the king says you shall have a master, the governor of your lands, which is exactly what it is. There is no difference in that than King John laying out barons and giving lands to barons and saying you serfs pay your duties to this baron. There's no difference. We should have said no, and then when they said no, and they wanted to bring in the borough anyways, they should have had to do it with troops. Which, in a sense, they did with the... Uh, did anyone get shot? No, nobody got shot, but I mean, I believe the National Guard was called out during the flood. Well, I mean, with the borough government being installed in the first mm-hmm. place, though. Was anyone shot over that? No. Then they didn't try hard enough to stop it. You're such a violent person. No, I'm not being violent. I'm just saying we allowed the city of Fairbanks, the interior, well, allowed the... something to be imposed on them without resisting it. This people hold the spirit of resistance, right? Isn't that what Jefferson said? No, that was that, that, was that people. Oh. Not, uh, not us. We, I mean, look at how many people here are totally dependent on federal money. How many jobs in this borough would disappear if we did not have federal money flowing in? And I mean, look at how how many people have got their panties in a bunch right now over the aspect of losing Ielson. Just as a, just as one one portion of that whole prize right there, look at how many people are just all the funds that come through the borough because of the EPA and the programs that we are kowtowing to. If if it were not for federal money, half of the I mean, what do we got? Fifty seven percent or fifty nine percent now of of the people that that live in this borough work for government at one layer or another. But how much money would come into this region if we didn't have a federal government? And we didn't have federal rules, statutes, and regulations. If we didn't have presidential rules, statutes, and regulations, which, what is the EPA? Who's the EPA governed by? Who controls the EPA? The executive power. It is executive, isn't it? Yeah. Part of it's the, the president branch. of the United States. The office of the presidency. Who is in direct war. I mean, think about it. The, the EPA is in direct war with the people of the United States. They're in direct war with the people of this borough. Look at how much infighting there's been with the people here in Fairbanks over the wood stoves. Mm-hmm. Would we even be thinking about that if it wasn't for the EPA? No. Divide and conquer. That's exactly what they've done. Instead of focusing ourselves on the office of the presidency and getting rid of it, or focusing ourselves on whatever uh, federal regulation, we focus on each other and fight each other and stick, throw sticks at each other. Divide and conquer. They've divided us to the point where we have no power to do anything to resist them. Nothing at all. And I think that you know, you want a talking point or whatever it is, quit living like a serf. Change your attitude towards government. Change your attitude. You see that in the party politics too really bad. I mean... I, if I have one more person tell me anybody but Obama, I think I'm going to puke in a trash can. Well, Actually, okay. probably in my hand. Okay, B, I, I want to get to a comment that was made by Rick Santorum this week about uh, how President Obama would be preferable to Mitt Romney. Uh, but first, let's go to the phones. 458-TALK is a number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Hello, this is Bill. Bill, what's on your mind? Well, uh, I think he uh, touched very briefly on uh, the question of uh, did we hire these people uh, the uh, borough assembly. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, well, uh, by and large, we didn't hire them, but somebody else did. Uh, namely, uh, uh, if you look at the uh, source of campaign contributions, you find that these people were hired uh, by the uh, public employee union or the, their members. Yeah, that's very true, which is... Uh which is a really good makes a really good case against democracy because you have a majority mob rule getting to getting whoever they want into power to keep the money flowing their way. Or or actually, you could even have uh, my minority uh, uh, rule as far as the decisions that they make because they take their money from a uh, distinct uh, minority uh, and therefore they don't have to even. Uh, uh, really put very much uh, fear of what the uh, p- public in general thinks of them. That's why they're willing to overrule a uh, an election where the people voted no against the uh, air pollution wood stove ordinance. 
Right. That's that's exactly right. Because, you know, if you think about it, I'm saying we need to change our attitude towards the government and quit living like serfs. At the same time, they treat us like serfs. I mean, once they get elected into that office, they absolutely think they are the power. They have the right. Well, I mean, the been, people they've can, been elected to make decisions for us, Josh. Right. Well, the people can. Your mm. point exactly. The people can make a ordinance against wood, um, against this wood stove man, and year after year they come back and try to change it again. They have no no regard for us. That's what they demonstrate. Yes, and I think it's because we have too much regard for them. Good point. Thanks for the call. 458 Talk is the number. Those of you still on hold, stay with us. We'll be right back after the Fox News here at the bottom of the hour. You've got it on the Saturday morning wake-up call on KFAR, brought to you by Far North Tactical over there at the corner of 8th and Lacey and by Bighorn Enterprises. And welcome back to our Saturday morning wake-up call right here on KFAR. Let's go on to the next phone call. Good morning. Who's this? Good morning, Steve. This is Mark. Hey, Mark. What's on your mind today? Well, you gentlemen touched on how we're electing these by the majority of the people. When was the last time the voter turnout was over 50% of registered voters? That's a good point as far as uh, democracy goes, right? Do we ever get a majority rule? Exactly. I mean, if only uh, 30% of the people are voting and uh, we have a three-way race, you know, you only need, what, 10% to win that one? 11 and you're there, right? That's the man. <laughs> yeah, it is pretty funny because if you think about it, even when uh, 11% get their guy in there, how many times do all 11% agree with what he does? Now, my other question is, wouldn't all the other people, the let's say 50 or 30% of the people who registered vote actually go vote, wouldn't that mean the other 70% by abstaining or uh, kind of voting in a silent voice sort of way? Ah, no faith vote. That's a good point. You know, what I'd love to see on every single one of our ballots is an option that says none of the above so that people could actually go in there and vote to vacate the office instead of there just simply being one person on the ballot or nobody so that that person automatically wins if he only gets one vote or having us dividing our loyalties between, you know, whatever flavor of the month is fighting each other, and then having the majority, like you're saying, majority of 11%, whatever, getting into the vote, to have an actual none of the above vote? What do you guys think of that? <laughs> that might work real well. I the other think- thing is term limits, and uh, we need to have a instant recall of some type. Gentlemen, I'll get off mine. Thank you for Thank you very much for the well call, done. Mark. I think he's got a good point, Uh, the 70% that don't vote. It'd be great. I think even better than none of the above. It'd be great if we had an election and no one showed up to show our faith in them. (laughs) No one shows up at all. Uh, Voter turnout today was zero. (laughs) People would still get elected, though. Yeah, exactly. And you know how? Because you're always always going to have that that person who votes. Well, hey, if nobody else is going to vote for me, I will. I want to win. Well, me and Josh would win because I'd vote for him, and he'd vote for me, and we'd vote for ourselves. (laughs) Majority of two. 458 Talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? This is Don. Don, what's on your mind? Yeah, I think... uh, there's a, there was a lady one time called Lady Houston, uh, Lucy Houston of England, and she I think she had it right. And what it, what it was was uh, wake up England, down with the government. And what it, she didn't trust her government, but she did love her country. I mean, that should be pretty much the uh, same thing everybody else should be doing, waking up and you know down with the government that they don't want. Yeah, that's a uh, really good point. Um, and if we look at it, we've been taught to think that the government is our country, right? But it's not. There's a difference between our country and our government. They're two separate entities. And our loyalty shouldn't... Go ahead. Our loyalty shouldn't... Be to our government. Shouldn't it be our loyalties be to each other, the people of the country? Well, even if you talk about loyalty to the country, I mean, at what point do you all cross over into nationalism, where all of a sudden you are are lifting up the United States, right or wrong? We have a duty to no, you said to the United ex- States. That's the government. Yeah, you know, even even then, I mean, you look at how many times you, you, the nationalist interest starts getting involved, and instead of talking about freedom for individuals, 
You're talking about exporting your empire. Right, and the nationalists always have a government that they're trying to promote, though. They're not promoting, the Germans weren't promoting the German people, per se. They were talking a good talk to get Hitler into power. Well, well sidebar here, isn't, isn't all patriotism basically just coming down to saying that, that I will support my country, my government, or my, or, or my nation? Right, right or wrong, I will support it no matter what it does. I think no, because I think you have to delineate between country and government. Yeah, but the definition of patriot is um, absolutism and absolute belief in the state. Yeah, but I think we can be patriots for liberty. I see the guys that uh, fought the revolution, the farmers, and those guys. Those guys were patriots. They weren't patriots to a they government because they, they didn't patri- have one. They, um, they weren't patriotic. Right. They didn't have a government to be patriots to, but they still called themselves the patriots. So what were they patriots of? Champions of? Liberty. Liberty. We're talking about the New England patriots? Oh, yeah. Their record isn't very good in over I'm going to go back with over the... the uh, go ahead. Oh, they went to the Super Bowl. Yeah, but I mean, look at, look at the you know decades of the... Anyway, go ahead. I'll go back to Lou Rockwell. The presidency insists on complete devotion and humble submission to his dictates, even while it steals the product of our labor and drives us into economic ruin. It centralizes all power unto itself and crowds out all competing centers of power in society, including the church, the family, business, charity, and the community. I'll go further. The U.S. presidency is the world's leading evil. It is a chief mischief maker in every part of the globe, the leading wrecker of nations, the usurer behind the third world debt, the bailer out of corrupt governments, the hand of many dictatorial gloves, the sponsor and sustainer of the new world order, of wars, interstate and civil, of famine and disease. By invoking this title, the presidency attempts to keep our attention focused on all foreign affairs. It is a diversionary tactic designed to keep us from noticing the oppressive rule it imposes right here in the United States. 458 Talk is the number. Go back to uh, something that was said earlier this week by Rick Santorum, where I mean, he's been characterized as, oh, Rick has lost it, because he said that if you're going to vote for Mitt Romney, you may as well vote for Barack Obama, because all he is is basically the same thing to a different degree, that you'd be getting, and I'm not sure if you could really even cross that delineation with Rick Santorum. I mean, how much different is he from Barack Obama? Uh, how do you respond to that when, when people say, oh, you got to vote for anybody but Obama? When you look at the voting record of people like Rick Santorum and when you look at the executive record of people like Mitt Romney, is there even a difference? Or would we actually maybe would we even be better off if we had another four years of Barack Obama? Or maybe we'd be better off not having an office of the presidency. When you look at uh, the debates, if you have watched any of them, it's really fun with the Republicans because – Three of them, every time, go through and tell you what they will do with the presidential power that they'll have. When I'm president, I will use my power to, I will use my power to stop Iran. He didn't, they don't say, if Congress tells me to stop Iran, I will stop Iran. No, they say, I will use my, I will use my office to do such and such. Over and over and over, take any aspect of it. I will use my office to create jobs which I think is hilarious. How in the world does a president create jobs unless they're federal jobs? What part does a president have in the economy besides destroying it? <laughs> that, <laughs> that's a good point. Uh, that, that also that, that depends on your your philosophy of economics. If you believe that somehow the governments actually are the, are the entities that are that invisible hand behind economics, or if you believe that uh, somehow there is a different invisible hand that... Well, that the, governs the economic. They are the invisible hand behind the government, or the government is the invisible hand behind the, our economy. That's why we have a bad economy right now. Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Yeah, this is Bob. Bob, what's on your mind? Hey, good morning, KFAR six sixty. Good morning. Uh, How nice are you doing? Snowy day. Yeah. Uh, okay. I was just wondering why you guys still counting and hanging chads and. Uh, how much money uh, GE put into the last presidency and uh, all the votes that are uh, counted in Alaska aren't even represented after they've elected the presidency. I'll just hang up and 
well, better fasten my seatbelt. <laughs> oh, by the way, I gave up on this uh, borough, gave up on the city. Uh, cooks, the crooks and the cops, man, they've finally gotten the last pennies out of me, so I'm, that's it. I'm tired of this. When you say you gave up on it, did you move out? I'm long. I'm, I'm just a figment of your imagination. <laughs> I've done, you know, talk radio on both stations, just pitiful, you know. I was just, I was just way beyond words. Well, thank you anyway. Appreciate the call. Go ahead, uh, Josh. Do you have something to say about that in terms of the uh, the issue of, well, you know, does our vote even matter at all up no. here in Alaska? That's why, uh, you know, it it would if we were back 200 years ago because we would have, uh, I think, two electorates, mm-hmm. three electorates. I don't know how many electorates Alaska would actually have. You'd have the electorates of each state chosen by the state um, representatives, the state congress. And those electorates would sit here. We would, they'd sit in Juneau, and they'd cast a ballot on who they wanted for president. And then the top five, if there was no clear majority, 50% or more, or over 50%, those top, well, I keep saying top five. It was, it's top three. Those top three would go in front of Congress, and Congress would choose that president. Today, our vote doesn't matter. I mean, in Alaska, we really don't matter because we have a popular vote, right? And so before our polls even close, well, heck, before Colorado's polls even close, usually, they've already chosen the president because the people's voice. Well, I would say that we in Alaska can claim that we have um, taxation without representation because our vote doesn't count. 458 Talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Hi there. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you? Hey, who, good. Who is this? This is Micah. Micah, what's on your mind? Um, I just had a couple of comments, and I'm, I've been enjoying listening to the conversation, so I'm trying not to lose my train of thought here. But I kind of wanted to go back to a little bit of borough business, if you all don't mind. Go ahead. Um, more on, on on a kind of a an idea about the borough, and I know this has been brought up before, but I have a personal interest in in the borough. I've only been up here a few years. I'm a, um, I had a military affiliation and brought me up here, and so I'm kind of a noob. And uh, so, pardon the ignorance. Um, I was thinking that with this borough deal and how the borough seems to stretch endlessly south um, and and be pretty wide area. And I'm I'm paying taxes down there um, towards Midway Lodge. Uh, for services that um, I would probably never see. I oh, oh, come on. We have a library up here that you can come up with. Right. Those. That's, that's right. Um, well, now, I, I I agree with taxation for services that you've um, elected yourself to opt into. For instance, if, if I wanted to have fire service in my area, which I don't currently, even though I pay taxes on, if I wanted fire services there, I could pay a subscription fee yearly, kind of like, a personal insurance or something like that and say, look, I'm going to give you this amount as insurance per year just in case something happens. You can come put out the flames at my house. Or I'm going to opt into my education and say, because I'm going to, you know, I want to be part of the greater good or I want to send my kids to the public school system. And now I'm going to opt in with my tax money. Now, why is it that in such a huge area we have a system where when you're, you're essentially never going to use any of these services, uh, in your neighborhoods of some kind of corporation where you take care of your own roads, where you can't opt in or opt out of services based on what you use. And then if you're in the city or if you're zoned inside of a community that says, hey, we are paying taxes, then you can make that choice beforehand to say, hey, you know, I'm going to opt into this community where we all pay the full mill rate because we're within the, the some reasonable boundaries. We're actually going to be using these services. Do you see what I'm saying? So I, I agree with paying the taxes, but I don't agree with the fact that I have to be forced into paying borough taxes when I'm 50 miles outside of Fairbanks. Or, or, let me let me uh, let me feel this one for just a moment, okay. Micah. Let me ask you a question. You you, t- you said you wouldn't have a problem if uh, the people in your neighborhood voted for a certain mill level for a service that you all wanted. What if there was just one person in your borough or, or in your neighborhood who didn't want that service? But the rest of you all voted for it. Would you go and force him to pay that mill rate? I, I think at that point that person 
right? And this is now I'm talking about like basically city limits versus not city limits. Okay, so number one, if you were moving into a city limits boundary, you would already be saying, you know, I want to live in this urbanized environment where there are services available. So that's by you would be going in with your eyes open. You'd be doing your education. I moved it, for instance, I moved into a neighborhood that had covenants. I read my covenant. I said, is this something I'm willing to deal with or not? So I'm in North Pole right now. I'm planning on moving to Salcha or Southern Salcha, as it were. Um, but I saw the covenants. I said, you know what? I can't have goats here. You know, that's fine. I'll have goats later. That's not a big deal. That's something I can deal with. I got a, I've got a neighborhood corporation. I got to pay into this road system. That's what I'm going to do because that's what the people in my neighborhood that's already established mm -hmm. are already doing. I can, I can go for that. Now, what you're saying is that if all of a sudden everybody in my neighborhood voted to be taxed, mm -hmm. to have mill, a mill rate levied against And that's what road service areas are. That's, in fact, that's what uh, all of the school bonds are. Every time that people vote yes on a school bond, you're voting to take money out of somebody else's pocket right. to well, go I pay for those. No on those, but uh -huh. yeah. I, and, and I understand what you're saying. Now, I mean, there should be, to me, there should be two different ways of going about this, all right? When you're inside the city limits, then uh, your neighborhood could possibly be able to force you to pay taxes, and you should know before you live in, move into city limits that that's a possibility. If you're living outside or you're living in a rural area, which I would say, I would hazard a guess a lot of people live that way out here, that nobody should be able to levy a tax against you that you have not opted into unless it's for that federal road or that state road that's right outside your house that's something that you have that you use on a regular basis because that's still a service that you use right i'm not against taxation i'm against the type of taxation that forces you to pay into a system that you have nothing to do with based on the fact that they need to create more bureaucracy and more jobs so they can pay their buddy basically that's you're saying you're getting ripped off well, I I feel a little ripped off now. I I was ignorant when I bought where I bought because I thought I was actually buying outside the borough because how far away I was. <laughs> and I and I realized later that it wasn't the case. Yeah, um, a and, far and, reach. And, and and I know that the borough has just continued to expand. If there was enough of us that got together in the rural areas and decided that we were going to opt out. I don't see how they're going to enforce borough taxes. I mean, what are they going to do? Tell them they're going to quit giving us fire service, which they don't provide anyways. You know what I mean? Like, what are the, what's what's the um, well? They'll take besides your, the fact they'll that take they can your take land. away your land, right? right? They can take away your property if you don't. But if there's if there's a lot of people that come together and say, "Look, we're not going to put up with this anymore," then what is the enforcement? They're not going to come around and arrest everybody and take everybody's land. Oh, I'm all for it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because it doesn't look to me as if anybody's ever wanted to stop this up until this point or has actually taken a, a cumulative action where everybody came together and said, look, like you all talk about, we own this government. We own our property. We want property rights, so we're going to enforce it. And there's just not enough. There's just not enough law enforcement. There's not enough governmental paperwork powers to change a huge voice that comes together and says, look, we're going to opt out of this. Here's our solution. This is what the people want, and they've spoken, and they have the majority. And what people do inside the city, to me, the city's kind of a different place. Do you see what I'm saying? Inside city limits, I think you're kind of under some different restrictions. Well, right. well but, I, think, I think you're on the right track. Unfortunately, your train of thought, which is correct, I believe, for the most part, is not the majority right now. Which is the main reason that we do this show, is to try to get more people to have your thought be the majority of thought. Would, did you all watch the news and see what just happened with the EPA and the Clean Water Act? No. And that's Supreme where the, the Supreme Court ruled that the homeowner has jurisdiction over the EPA. The Correct. The EPA cannot come in and find somebody for having dirty water on their own land. <laughs> Absolutely. So basically... Somebody won against the EPA. So yeah. how can they tell us we can't have dirty air in our land? <laughs> well, well, right, but this is what's happening. Enough people got together and made enough of a valid point that forced a decision that went the way of the people instead of the big regulatory agency. The borough's not as big as the EPA. 
right? They have Correct. about yeah. They have less teeth than the EPA. They have a lot of actually they have very little teeth when it comes down to enforcement powers. They have no teeth. Right. So the only reason they've been allowed to expand their boundaries is by is by this self perpetuating system of 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 justifying it to themselves and then going ahead and ruling on it mm-hmm. based on what they feel they personally want. Now I know I wasn't here, so right? So I'm I'm coming in as an outsider complaining about it. But maybe it takes that extra objectivity to help start the ball rolling. I was really encouraged by that EPA thing. I was like, yeah, those are our guys, and they won. Yeah, that's, so that's good. It's kind of exciting. So there's positive news out there, too. Well, it's a good lesson for the people here at the borough assembly when they say, well, the EPA is telling us we must. No, no you we, don't. The, There's e- never a <laughs> must. We tell the EPA to go pound sand in a rat hole. Thanks for the call. 458-TALK <laughs> is a number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? This is Donigan. Donigan. What's yeah. on your mind? Um, the idea that, uh, I, I like what the last guy said, but the idea that, too, when you know, you look at stuff that government, and it don't matter any type of government, you know, looks at taxation as a form of uh, income for, you know, their pockets and their house and everything else. Uh, look what happens. It's kind of really uh, double taxation or without representation. Uh, we pay money to the federal government as a form of tax to have the military. And then you got the people on the, uh, and, and so the military pays for housing, VHU, VHA, and stuff like that. Then you get a private entity, privatization comes in, and they're going to take, take care of the government housing. So this is all happening at 49. And then they get that VHU and VHA, so money's coming into this private organization. But then the city and the borough try to figure out how can we get this money because now it's, it's a joint venture between the private entity and the military. So they came up with this thing that okay this private entity is gonna have to pay taxes as to uh, you know whatever it was for ten years. It, it's just the idea though that you know you're not only are you taxed once, but you're taxed all the way through just to turn around and make money for uh, governmental entity. I'm off. Thanks for the call. Appreciate it. 458 Talk is a number. This is your Saturday morning wake-up call. Who's this? Hi, Cecily. Hey, Cecily. What's on your mind today? Yeah, I was uh, listening to the gentleman before last, and he was saying that, you know, these people that agreed to these covenants and stuff, except that they come up with more rules and codes and regulations for the people that actually, you know, came here way long time ago and and where they live was was rural and then now you know they changed the laws to and it's no longer rural and so the people that moved all around them decided they didn't like what he has on his property and went to um to to the mayor and had him you know uh come out with his 20 thieves well minus one who had moral uh had morals uh, to steal all their things. The thing is, is the Constitution says we want to be just left alone. And uh, Michael Duke said we couldn't get enough people out there in Salcha to secede from the borough. You have to have a certain amount of people before you have power. So anyway, it's just every day they take away another say in which way you decide how you ride the tide. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the call, Cecily. Appreciate it. 458 Talk is the number. This is the Saturday morning wake up call. Who's this? Mr. Winston. Winston, what's on your mind today? Uh, uh, essentially sort of covered, uh, touched on it, but uh, uh, the, the gentleman that called in from uh, bought land in Salsha, if he can get uh, uh, enough of his neighbors together, uh, uh, petition the LBC and, uh, and move the borough lines, uh, uh, it can be done. He can get out of the borough. Right, theoretically, Winston. I mean, but but as long as you still, I mean, in, at, at what point do you think you're going to have the state step back in and say, well, you know what, you got enough people there in Salter, you're going to have to have your own borough now. And then the, and then they they come down uh, and by, by well, either the force or the threat of force get you to comply. Oh, uh, 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 as, as as long as they don't go in debt, even if the state 
uh, 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 forces a borough in the next election cycle, they can vote it out. <laughs> um, I it's, mean, it, it, it's worth a shot, isn't it? And that, and that's again back to that issue of that's what it comes down to. Once you get into debt, once you've bonded for something, you have to have that taxation mechanism by the state constitution, hence the borough. Right, right, right. You you have to stay out of debt, and uh, oh, you have to have enough people. I mean, the people in Salsha got raped. I mean, it was uh, uh, all they got out of that deal was a uh, 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 bookmobile and a uh, 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 transfer site. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, just uh, 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 stay out of debt and vote it out. All right, good call. Thanks, Winston. Appreciate it. Four five eight talk is a number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Uh, this is Natalie. Natalie. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. I figured that you might have some more questions, but uh, Winston's right about that. You can you can petition to get out, but you know we're, the borough is so far into debt already that it's very difficult to yeah, um, to do that because because our debt is so high. For anyone who doesn't know, Natalie Howard is uh, one of our borough assembly members. Thanks for calling in, Natalie. Appreciate yes, that. Let me let me ask you I, though. I mean, well, you, you you say that the the borough is so far into debt. Uh, at, at what point can anyone ever opt out? I mean, basically, That's we have it. been we've been voted this 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 big burden of debt by people that were here before we were here, and that maybe have been gone and moved away, and yep. we're read, still carrying read, their debt. Read your bond when you vote on the bonds, or when you look at the bonds. Read those very carefully because you are forcing debt onto your neighbors when you approve those bonds. <laughs> and you know, and we've we've come beyond a mobocracy, I guess. What I'm saying too about these petitioning to get out of the borough. The things that happened two years ago, I guess it was, with the annexation, remember, of the West End Fred Meyer, um, when the city annexed to the borough. Right. Um, the, one of the reasons that the state said yes and approved this and, and was behind it was that it took the it took a, a level of bureau, bureaucratic burden away from the state that the city would not cover. So you're you're seeing situations where two different um, government different governmental agencies are acting independently in their own best interests. I mean, that's that's what I'm seeing a lot of, which is, I, I think, a stage of, of government that we get to when we've get, gone beyond the, the, the mob rule, the, the, the majority plundering the minority. We're seeing a situation where different governmental agencies are basically protecting themselves you know, we're we're well beyond having any regard for the the, the people or thinking that the people are so, you know sovereign, and they're just out there protecting themselves, which is what you see with these annexations and um, a lot of the decisions these days. Well, isn't that the point of a bureaucracy? It, yes. Yep. Self preservation. Mm -hmm. We're out of time, Natalie. Thanks for calling okay. in. Appreciate yep. it. Uh, coming up next. Going to shift gears ever so slightly into Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. Tell your friends we are streaming live at KFAR660.com. And we'll be right back with more live local radio after the Fox News right here on KFAR. And welcome to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. This is local talk radio 660 on your AM dial and Streaming live around the world at KFAR660.com. Patriots Lament is brought to you each and every week by Far North Tactical over there at the corner of 8th and Lacey and by Big Horn Enterprises. Big or small, they'll take care of it for you over there. You uh, need some dirt moved or you need them to move them out. Give them a call over there at Big Horn Enterprises. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, from Big Horn Enterprises, we've got Josh Bennett in the studio. Josh? Morning, Steve. And uh, from Far North Tactical, we have Aaron Bennett. Good morning, Aaron. Good morning, Steve. And we also have somebody on the hotline right now. Do we want to go there, or do we want to go to something you wanted to say I just first, want to Josh? read something really quick here. Um, on the, the quotes that we have at the beginning, I just wanted to reread one of this part. Why stand we here idle? What is it the gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear or peace so sweet to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take. But as for me, giving me liberty or giving me death, that is why we're in the problem that we are now. It's because we are not willing to be Patrick Henry's. We're we're not. Give me liberty or give me... Uh, it's, is it's, life so dear, peace so sweet, to be traded for chains and slavery? We're so afraid. What's the song with Uprising? We should never be afraid to die. 
fear God, not man. Let's not be afraid of these people. Let's take back, well, take back, let's get back to who we are. Th- th- we th- have to get back to who we are. That we is the are... argument, though, that, that they use every single time that they get us to go along with borough control of whatever issues. Oh, we're going to lose our federal funds. That's if not we, who we are. If we say no to this, they're going to take away our federal teat. Oh, no. I was, uh, let's take the call. It's, uh, I think it's Natalie on the hotline. All right. Good morning. Welcome to the show. Good morning. It is Natalie. Natalie Howard, I, I, one of our borough assembly members. Go yeah, ahead, Natalie. Well, I just stuck around because I, I actually called in to uh, address, you know, you were talking about the Office of the Presidency last hour and the Lou Rockwell interview discussion, and you made some points. And I pulled up my uh, Declaration of Independence because a lot of the points that Josh was making were very, very similar to what is written in the Declaration of Independence as to why you know, the founders, um, you know, said said enough with this king and we are going to have liberty. Um, so I guess I just wanted, you know, uh, people to be, uh, you know, remind them of that. And if you're trying to make an, uh, a comparison between our current government and maybe, you know, kings or royalty, and it just seems oddly similar that 250-plus years later... Um, you know, this this article is saying the same thing the Declaration of Independence uh, did. Yeah, and some of that is uh, in the Declaration of Independence that Thomas Jefferson wrote against the grievances against their king. Let's mm-hmm. uh, imagine the office of the presidency. Same. I, I think that the, it, it, they're both, both so very similar at this point in our history. Um, just, just some of the things, I, I, one of my favorite ones here is in the Declaration of Independence, is, he has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. Hello, Alaska. Yep. Uh, he has combined <laughs> with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our Constitution and acknowledged by our la- laws, giving his assent to their, their acts of pretended legislation. Um, he has effected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. Sorry. He's, how about, uh, he's cutting off, he's cut off our trade with all parts of the world. Yep. Oh, that's a great one. De- yep. Deprived us in many cases of the benefit of trial by jury, NDAA, Patriot Act. For yep. transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offices, Guantanamo, which is now a new law that the king, or the office of the presidency is given. Whereas uh, there's one with the the lands. One in here is directly has to do with the the lands. Shoot. Oh, we'll yeah, find it. Just uh, uh, for just anybody who's just joining us, you're, you're reading from the Declaration of Independence. These are right. grievances yes. that were lodged against the King of England in the 1700s, which seem to be apropos to the very events that are happening today. With our president, and, and it's not just, uh, I wish people would understand it is not Barack Obama who has done this. The office of this, the president. This is something that, I mean, we, we saw it happening under George W. Bush. We saw it happening under Clinton. We saw it happening under Bush the first. We saw it happening under Reagan. I mean, look at the well, look at the Department of Education. And I think you make, a, you make a good point, because I think it's important to differentiate between the collective office and the individual. Right, the, I, the I'm, office I'm calling, itself. I'm not calling to, to criticize individuals, whether they be in the uh, the assembly or in in any of the in bureaucrat or in any of these offices. I mean, I think one of the things that we have a problem with is that we're viewing our government t- today as a collective, and when you have that arbitrary view of these collectives, you think that well, they're they're there to do this for us, or they're there to do that for us, and and you know, it's it's. We're not attacking the individuals. It's, it's the collective offices that, the seat that really have on. to be examined. Right. Here's one from the Declaration of Independence, what I think is very much written for Alaska. He has endeavored to, pre- to prevent the population of these states for that purpose obstructing the laws of naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. 
He's a pre- he has endeavored to prevent the population of these states. How much land in the state of Alaska is federal land that we have no right to do 80, anything about? 80%. 80% of that's how much. Mm-hmm. So the Office of the Presidency has endeavored to prevent the population of the state. Thanks. Can you go move on federal land? Yes. Can, can you? No. no. Well, what if we did? What if we did? What if the borough... I, and again, we got to make it as local as possible because I don't think I don't think our governor currently has a uh, has a pair. I mean, he might, but they've got to be locked up somewhere because he talks a big talk about challenging the federal government, but what has he actually done? Is it? Uh, I don't think anything. How much uh, can? But, the, but what if what if the borough, with the federal lands that are inside the borough, said we are going to offer these lands for sale? What would happen? Would they would they send in federal troops to kick the people out? Well, I'd say that they don't have the right to sell it. They should just be open to people to move on to the land. What government a- entity owns well, land? Think, think about how many. Well, even okay. <laughs> but well, how about picking. how about this, Natalie? How much of the how much land here in the borough actually belongs to the borough? Um, not a, not a whole lot. There there is, there are um, tracts of land, and we do have a land management department, and they are supposedly um, selling land and managing it for you, <clears throat> but it's not a majority of the land in the borough. It's owned by things like, the, like you said, the federal government, the state government, the mental mental health trust owns land. Most of the land in this borough is owned by multitudes of different um, government agencies, not privately owned. Can you give me one example of our borough government um, resisting the federal government? To protect uh, individual liberties, ever? I, I can't do that, and it, it's been a frustration to me because I have been tr- trying to say no to a lot of these things. I mean, maybe some of the individual members, again, in, in the borough assembly, <clears throat> will do this. But I do think as a, as a majority, it, it's always mob rule down there at the borough, and whatever the assembly says, it's taken as a collective. Um, so it... Do no, you, the answer is no. Do you think that it's uh, well, maybe you can't answer this, but earlier we were talking about people. My view of it, when people come in to basically beg the borough representatives, mm-hmm. I mean, is that am I off? Am I just being a no. jerk there? But because the, that's what I, it seems like to me. You guys sit up <clears throat> on your um, thrones basically, mm-hmm. and the surf comes in and sits at his lowly position, and mm-hmm. gets three minutes to give his grievance. Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't think, I, I think that your description of that was, was, was right on. I mean, that would be my interpretation, and everybody has a different interpretation, but mine would probably be similar to yours. Um, the, the one thing is, is that because we do follow a modified version of Robert's Rules of Orders for meetings, there are some good things about those rules, but then there are some severe limitations. One is the way that we interact with the public in a public meeting where there's no back and forth, there's no questions. Um, mm-hmm. Now, you, you do have a little bit of leeway, actually, with the whoever the presiding officer is. They can, they, they are running that meeting, and they can have a little bit of leeway. I tell you from the other side, like sitting in one of those throne-like chairs, it's very frustrating to me sometimes because it's hard for us even to have an open argument and debate because of the way we have to run the meeting. So if, let's say, a, another assembly member were to say something I wanted to argue with or, or provided an alternative argument for, I may have to wait, you know, four other members before a, able to address that. So there's no uh, real possibility, it, it, it's limited possibility for back and forth debate. And that's one of the biggest things I guess I lament in our public process is that the lack of, of debate that's allowed in your public meeting, whether it's between the citizen and an assembly person or a representative, you know, in public, or whether it's between or amongst assembly members. Can you, is it possible for the borough to change the way laws are passed? Um, Yes, it is. Um, It it, it is possible, and those would be things where um, it would be interesting to look at that and, and you could change the code. I was talking to a friend the other day, so if... It was mostly his idea. If we, uh, how would we go about, let's say that we would want to change the way laws were passed, where every law would have to fit on a three by five card, be no writer on it at all. I mean, it just has to be plain English. It has to fit on the three by five card. Mm-hmm. It would take 
three quarters of the majority to pass it and only 25 percent to repeal it and every law would sunset in two years you would you would have to write an ordinance and you know to formally uh, change a part of our borough code and how you would do that would I encourage everybody to read your code and your laws and you'll I encourage it from my perspective as well because it would be wonderful to have people read these and start redlining giving comments because from there you can start writing these ordinances so you your friend or you would have to go read our code and start you know taking things out and modifying that and that's what these ordinances are they're constantly modifying your code but even then Natalie couldn't the borough assembly come right back in and change whatever yeah. it is that the people voted in I mean, it, even if we voted the way to do that, I mean, it's just like our own. I mean, every single yep. time, it was only two years. Yeah, but they'd have to get 75% of the people. Yeah, and, and you've got a, you've got an issue here where, you know, you we're, we're talking really, even even we amongst ourselves are talking about politicizing law. You know, we're, we're, we're now talking, mm-hmm. you know, maybe beyond what the, you know, what's in the Constitution allowing us to to do. We're just as bad as the, some of the other people right now by by arbitrarily saying 75% or, you know, we're throwing these numbers out. And to me, that's politicized law. Well, I'm just and trying I to think, think of a way to cut yeah. down on their ability to pass law. I mean, I'd rather well, have a law that says they don't they can't pass a law, but that's not yeah, going to happen. I, I <laughs> Make a law that they can pass a law. I think a real effective way to be become aware of what your laws are, kind of be shocked on, oh, my gosh, is that really there, and, and, and start to give people a lot of support to do some repeals. I know you guys have always talked about, you know, when do we repeal law? Well, you, under the current system, which I'm not saying is perfect, and I'm not saying I even even like, but under the current system, you do have to have a majority of assembly members to repeal a law. I think that would be more effective. Or to have the assembly can write up a resolution and say, you know, we want to go through our, our code and repeal anything that's not constitutional. That's an example. It's not a something I'm interested in necessarily right now, but um, you know, those are things you could do with the right assembly. Oh. Well, if if you can have the the way that it is that you need a majority, why can't you have a repeal that need only takes a minority? A, a repeal of a law that only takes a minority? Right. A minority <laughs> to repeal it. Wouldn't that uh, be more representative to the uh, minority at large? So if 51% vote in a bunch of jackholes, <laughs> then the uh, 49% can rest at ease because their minority rule, rule, you know, I don't like that word. But anyways, their minority would be able to protect them by repealing laws that the majority would pass against them. Yes, I, I, but again, I think we're politicizing this. Well, and we're, and we're also getting yeah. way off down the road of, of, of hypothetical because right now you look at the people who are on the assembly. What was the vote the last time when it came to the wood smoke issue? Wasn't it like it's six, five, it was five, six four. To, five four? Yeah, five four. Well, and I, I think I, I want to get to a deeper concept here. I mean, it's, it's it's much simpler than that. If your assembly members were talking principles and not politics on things, and and a lot of people don't understand that, but if they were actually talking about the issues and principles and just law, not politicized law you'd have this change. So, for example, you're making an analogy between the borough assembly and, like, royalty, right, on your first hour. Mm-hmm. And and you do have people on the assembly right now, and you do have people in this community that think that, hey, we elected you so you can make these decisions. Like, you can govern the rules of the sandbox. I've, I've heard that before in the assembly. Uh, you can, you know, we, we that's what we're here to do. And, and, and that's more important is to start questioning that mentality and those changes, because then government will understand that they need to withdraw from, you know, making these things overtly political. When you politicize your laws, you lose justice. Well, that's everything they do over there is political positive law, isn't yep. it? Yep, it is. And that's where if you could, if, if people held them accountable and you started, you know, going back to principle and saying, we don't want this politicized, um, don't go, to, you know... Who are you to go down there and, and people go down there and ask the assembly all the time to politicize laws because they think they're going to get a benefit from it? And and there have been some in- instances recently where it's backfired on people. I mean that's the 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 one thing that be you know point at some of these examples. How's your politicized working for you, law pl- working for you now 
that that you thought you skewed the deck to you, but it really went against you because we've removed justice. Well, yeah, exactly, because we're talking about political law. Everything that you're saying, every law that they pass is a political law. So what can we do to restrain the borough? I mean, can is can it be done with political law? Or I mean, it's certainly no, I, not going to be done with um, common law because they don't they don't even uh, recognize it. Yeah. I think I, I personally think we're in, we're on a longer we have to look longer term than just the immediate, mm-hmm. and that we have to start understanding and, and helping our, our friends and neighbors in our community to really have these hard discussions and understand what just law is versus political law, and get people to go back to just law because the number one problem, in my opinion, at the assembly is people aren't doing their job because they're not following just law. They're following political law because they feel they can decree this on others. They are royalty, if you if you will. And we've got to go back and redefine what government really is and explain to them. And I think that the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, these are all, and history, are all wonderful tools to do this. You know, but we've got to have these discussions amongst ourselves and not allow our friends and neighbors to go down there and entice the borough assembly into politicizing laws for the benefit of their friends. Easier said than done. Right, it's a matter of hearts and minds, which is exactly, exactly what we it, talked about earlier. We've got to change people's minds to look down. It might be generations from now, but one more person changing their mind and their outlook at uh, politics and their outlook at government and the dissolving of their sovereignty, eventually we would get back our liberty. And, and, and fundamentally, in my opinion, again, you're not going to change hearts and minds through political law, which is no more than force. You can't change people's hearts and minds by forcing them into it. No, that that no. doesn't that doesn't work. Good point. Natalie, and, thanks yeah. so okay, much for the I'm, call. Appreciate it. Listen. All right, yeah. we've got uh, three other lines on hold. Four five eight talk is a number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Yeah, this is Brent. Brent, what's on your mind today? Um, I have one thing that I'd like to cover, and and that's the NDAA, National Defense Authorization Act, and uh, the individual that is important, I think, there is Don Young, and uh, I've talked with his office, his people tell me that he was not aware of Section 1021 when he signed that. My response to that is, did Don Young take an oath to support the Constitution, and if he did, isn't he obligated to repeal that law and to impeach Obama for Obama not following the Constitution? And I think all this comes down to uh, we the people need to hold those in office to their oath. If they don't uphold their oath, they need to be removed from office. I I agree. Um, We're getting a yeah, a little bit of feedback. In. We, right. uh, I think it's the state of Montana is actually has a recall right now against their congressmen and senators that voted for the NDAA. I mean, it's pretty pathetic, right? Um, Don Young, well, I didn't read it. What the heck are you doing voting on it for? 1021, six, I think it's sections 1021 and 1022. That's why why are they voting on these things if they don't even know what's in them? Well, yeah, and, once again, let's pass it and see what's in it later, but that that's kind of I mean, you're right. They, it, this is a it's a huge bill, the NDAA, and this is just one section in it. But this little bitty section in here is taking away our most fundamental one of our most fundamental uh, uh rights. Yeah, and and we can ask ourselves uh Sorry about the feedback there, but we can ask ourselves if if they pass this law and we say, well, it's taking away one of our fundamental rights, is it actually a law? Isn't it unconstitutional? Yeah. So is it even a law? Are we obligated to, well, we're not going to be obligated to follow it because they're, it's actually against us, but well, is it actually a law? What we're obligated to do is to remove people from office that don't uphold their oath. Yeah. Right. And I'm not sure how you do that, other than writing letters and getting more people involved. But to me, that's what has to happen: is people need more people need to tell those who are supposed to be serving us 
and of course I would include Begich and Murkowski, but they they don't even listen to uh, you know uh, Don Young is the best out of the three, but uh, he's not doing anything either. And actually, on Michael Duke's show one one time, I called in there while Don Young was there, and I mentioned the impeachment of, of Obama and, and his obligation to uphold the oath, etc. And Don Young's response was, "I'm not going there." That's all he had to say. Yeah, because they've they've completely neglected not only their oath to office, but their duty to office. I mean, we just talked about in the first hour exactly what Congress's duty was oh. to the President of the United States was to hold him to account and impeach him if he violates the Constitution, which would say that we'd have to impeach Obama, yeah. George Bush, uh -huh. Clinton, the other Bush, Bush the first. Reagan, uh -huh. Carter, Nixon. Every single one of them has done the things beyond the, the, the scope of the Constitution, Even and yet... George Washington, after the Whiskey Rebellion, yeah. he later lamented that and said, I went over my bounds as the President of the United States. Yeah. And, and yet, what do we do? We are asleep. We are asleep at the wheel, and we don't care, do we? And, and just about every one of the senators and congressmen passed this NDAA, which has this section in, in it. So not any of these... not any of all of these people that are supposed to that have taken an oath are doing what they said they do and i think that they uh you know if uh, don young was saying well he didn't read it or whatever he didn't understand i think you can i think that's a cop out because we have on our website at patriots lament um Rand Paul standing up and speaking out against it and reading these sections of the act and saying these are unconstitutional. How can you even think to pass these into law? Well, and then you had John McCain Paul, saying, well, that's what the people want. Ron Paul has introduced a bill to repeal sections 1021 and 1022 yeah. of the NDAA. Yeah, and I don't think that he has I don't think he has any support in it. Not much. You don't hear it uh, in the presidential debates. Uh, you, you just don't. They, they don't even bring that up. But well, he, while they did. he was on his campaign trail, he took a day, or you know, he took time off to introduce a House bill. I forget what it is, but there is a bill by, of all people, Ron Paul to repeal Section 1021 and 1022. Yeah, he even took Be right back. <laughs> You've got it on KFAR. This is Local Talk Radio, and you are listening to Patriots Lament right here on this Saturday morning. I'm Steve Floyd, the monkey behind the machine. Joining me in the studio right now, Josh Bennett. Aaron has uh, stepped out, apparently. He had to go and uh, make some money today or something. Oh, good. Good, good. At least somebody's still working in this borough. <laughs> Yeah. That's not working for government. It's funny. Uh, the the news break. It, it's uh, they're talking about Obamacare and uh, was it Mitchell? I don't know who it was. It was the I think it was a Sen Senator Mitchell. He said uh, people don't want Obamacare and they think it's unconstitutional. Well, then do your stinking job and repeal it. Come on, we have a House majority, right? Well, the Democrats are scared to death they're going to lose the election the next go-around because they passed Obamacare. So you know that a probably a good chance a majority on the Senate side will vote to repeal it. Do your job then. <laughs> do your job. Well, no, they're going to let the Supreme Court decide. Well, that's uh, what no, they no, always do. Their job, the their job is to get reelected. Mm -hmm. you, you look at how many – I think this is one of the biggest problems that we have with a professional – representation the fact that these people are getting paid to stay in office for as long as they possibly can and it's not just a matter of term limits it's a matter of changing people's minds and changing the philosophy we do not have a citizen government we don't we have a bunch of professional bureaucrats people who move from representing businesses in front of congress to representing the people in congress to going on the other side to the lobbying firms or, or to the big government or to the big uh, corporations that they represented before. I mean, it's it's like this revolving door in which they go from one post to the next between big business and big government. Am I wrong? No, you're right. And maybe a step, which I don't see it happening, but a good step maybe would be to start with the 17th Amendment, repeal that to where the senators aren't elected by popular vote, popular mm -hmm. democratic vote, mm -hmm. and make them accountable to the states that they represent instead of to these basically wishful wish pots of people that get them voted in and say, pass the money back, buddy. We got you elected. Where's our money, buddy? And and for people who think that, oh, that's just too hard a process, well, we, we, re we repealed the uh, 
the Prohibition Amendment, didn't we? Yeah, and we passed the 17th Amendment, so why couldn't we get it repealed and put it back in the hands? I mean, that really would be in the hands of the people yeah. then. Yeah. Not this democratically election vote is bunk. It does not work. If, if you can't figure out that democracy does not work, then you're sleeping. Your eyes are closed and your head's stuck in three feet of snow. <laughs> get the senators back to where our local representatives in Juneau, and I cringe when I say that, because as soon as I said that, I thought about the local, our representatives in Juneau, and that's pretty demoralizing. But at <laughs> least if we could get that back, maybe, I mean, be a step in the right direction, maybe, right? Get back to where it was, and then we'd have senators that were directly accountable to the state I, of honestly, Alaska. Honestly, honestly, Josh, I mean, I got to be honest with you. I think we are too far gone. I think we are too far down the road where you know we're basically on a runaway train that's going downhill, and we've got a bunch of people throwing coal into the engine, into the furnace room, saying, "Yeah, faster, faster." Other people debating on the side. Well, you know, what kind of engine would be better to get us around the curve down there? Yeah. Right. Uh, we're 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 heading toward the curve in the track. We are not going to make it out. And right now we need to be talking about getting off the train instead of trying to slow the train down or instead of trying to change the type of engine on the train. We need to be talking about getting off. Well, until we rethink who we are, reexamine who the citizen is in comparison to the government. And I know we talk about this ad nauseum and maybe people are tired of it, but until... Everyone thinks like I do. I'm going to keep saying it. <laughs> we need to get off our train. We need to quit being a bunch of weenies and ex- expecting government to do these things for us. I mean, it's pathetic. We expect Congress to repeal Obamacare. Well, how about when Obamacare is passed and they start, well, it's passed, when they start shoving it down our throats, we stand up and say, no, we're not buying your junk. Mm-hmm. We're not going to participate with you anymore. If tell the the sovereign people, and I'm not talking about the sovereignty movement and these silly things like that, until you embrace who you are as a citizen in this land, as you're not a subject. Uh, I'll go back to uh, John Jay. Like I said, he was the first Supreme Court Justice of the United States. He was a brilliant man. Brilliant. I would say that all of Congress, well, I'd have to take out Ron Paul and maybe his son too, Rand. The rest of them combined, every bureaucrat combined and Obama throwing his big brains in with them couldn't hold a candle as a collective to the wisdom that this guy had. He wrote our Constitution, and he wrote that by reading John Locke. He wrote it because he knew uh, Blackstone's law like the back of his hand. He said, at the revolution, which was the war, and if you think about the revolution, what are we talking about with the revolution? John Adams said the revolution wasn't this, the war itself, wasn't the fight. It was people's minds. The revolution had already been won because the people's minds had been changed. They had fought this in their mind that we are the sovereign people. We deserve. They don't have to earn it. They deserve liberty as free men. All men are created equal and have the right to life, liberty, and property. So when, he said, when I'm talking about the revolution, I'm talking about the minds, the war that was won with the people before the first shot was ever fought, shot. The first shot was ever fired. You have to win the minds of the people. And John Jay said, at the revolution, the sovereignty devolved on the people. We threw off the king. We are the kings. They are truly the sovereigns of the country, and they are sovereigns without subjects. No man is under Steve, no man is under me, no man is under Natalie Howard, no man is under John Davies, no man is under President Obama. They are sovereigns without subjects and have none to govern but themselves. The citizens of America are equal as fellow citizens and as joint tenants of their sovereignty. So we have no one embrace this. No one rules over you. You shouldn't want to rule over someone else, but no one rules over you. These people are insignificant. I know that they're significant in the fact that they have force and power and can kill us. Why should we be afraid of that? I mean, I don't want to die, but why are we so scared of force and power? Um, James Wilson, who was another uh, Supreme Court justice in the first Supreme Court, another guy. I mean, folks, do yourself a favor. If you want an action point, look up the writings of John Jay 
Look up the writings of James Wilson. James Wilson said that the, concerning the prerogative of kings, prerogative of kings, and concerning the sovereignty of states, much has been said and written. It's like, yeah, we all know how wonderful the king is. But little has been said and written concerning the, a subject more dignified and much more important, which is the majesty of the people. The mode of expression which I would substitute in the place of that generally used is not only politically, but also for between true liberty and true taste, there is a close alliance, classically more correct. It's more correct to have the majesty of the people than the majesty of the office of the presidency. Which goes back to what we were talking about in the last hour. Mm -hmm. 458 Talk is a number. We go to the phones. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Hi, this is Randy. Hey, Randy. What's on your mind today? Oh, I just wanted to let you know that the House of Representatives in the Congress did vote to repeal Obamacare, and that vote occurred on January 9th, 19th, rather, 2011, and the vote was 245 to 189, and three heroic Democrats also joined in uh, that vote to repeal Obamacare, but of course, it was not going to be going through the Senate, because the Democrats controlled the Senate. So that has happened, but what I called about is, did you see today's front page picture on the newspaper, on the Fairbanks paper for March 24 today? No, I, I have not. Okay. It's got a big picture of a rally that was held yesterday at the corner of uh, College Road and Old Steese, and the title of the article here is Re Reproductive Rights Get Local, Supporters Rally Against Insurance Mandated Birth Control. And I really appreciate those citizens. I didn't even know about it until I read the paper today, but they were standing up against that uh, the tyranny of the Obamacare mandate, saying that... Uh, insurance companies have to cover contraception and uh and they're certainly right though i would extend it beyond religious freedom which is what they were championing religious freedom i would say any american citizen whether they're an atheist or whoever they they are should have the right to choose what they want covered in their insurance company that's a that's a matter between the insurance company and the customer and the federal government has absolutely no business dictating that the insurance company has to cover some certain area like for instance i eat healthy vegetables, but I wouldn't want the federal government saying that my health insurance has to provide healthy vegetables for me. <laughs> I have insurance just to cover catastrophic costs, not expected everyday expenses. Right. And, you know, it's uh, I agree with you. It's good that these folks came out there to um, stand up against that mandate in it, but it's too bad that more people aren't out there on what you're talking about, the absolute principle behind Obamacare should be, we should be all up in, whoops, I almost said up in arms. We should all huh. be upset and out protesting and writing, doing whatever we do by the simple fact that they pass something like Obamacare, not just the little mandates here and there. I mean, it's un, I'm glad that they did that, but it's unfortunate that these people weren't mad as soon as it was passed and, and riding in the streets. Thanks for the call, Randy. 458 Talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Hi, it's Cecily. Hey, again. Cecily, again, what's on your mind? Oh, well, I was thinking that it's really hard to change the minds of the people when you have, you know, a government public uh, indoctrinating people to obey all authority. If, you know, since all the children are, are taught that, then they already are taught not to to um, depend on their own minds to to uh, make any decisions. They're indoctrinated and to, to obey. Yeah, it, you, you're right, but they had um, anti-liberty folks who've had a good time preference in their, in their mentality because they've said, we're not going to do it now, but we know in 100 years it's going to be this way for us. So we have to take that same mentality in our own lives and say, teach the people better yeah teach or just you know we're not trying to force anything on people we can't do that but we can talk about different ideas and talk about ideas that are correct and maybe it's not going to happen tomorrow it's not going to happen the next day it might all collapse but at least hey if it collapses right then we can say well here's what we were talking about before then let's let's give this a try because this ultimately no. utterly failed and this is one of those things too to keep in mind you know Cecily you're familiar with what happened after Hitler fell in in Nazi Germany right mm -hmm. how hard was it for people who were Nazis who were part of the Nazi party to come forward with any kind of well I mean believability 
afterwards and say, hey, vote for me to help lead this new nation because I was a part of the old system that, that led you into war and collapse. It was impossible. I mean, to be a, to be a member of the Nazi party after the Nazis fell was a complete disgrace. People had to hide their background in order to get elected. And if it ever came out that a person had been a Nazi or had been even a member of the Nazi party, it was a complete repudiation of any ability for them to lead. Now, you look at these people who are urging us, cajoling us. You have to be a part of the system. You have to become a Republican. You have to become a Democrat. Really? Well, what about when it all collapses? Who's going to rise up afterwards? Those who said, oh, vote for me now because uh, you, well, I was a part of the system that was before that led you into the collapse, right? Mm -hmm. No, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Yeah, if what we can do now benefits our great-great-grandkids, it's worth it. We have to not be so, I don't know, we're, (laughs) we can't be so much that we want what we want now. I want to be free now. I do. That's right. I don't think it's going to happen now. We have so, to look for our posterity, yes. uh, and uh, not not even necessarily our own children, but their children, to say we have to put some things in place now that are going to worm their way through the system or that are going to be hel- helpful to rebuild after the system collapses, which is honestly the way I think things are headed right now. Selfish is the word I was looking for. We're, we're selfish. We as American people are very selfish people, which to a certain point it's fine when if you're going to say I'm selfish about my liberty. But we're selfish in the fact that we want things to happen right now. So we go down to the borough and say, change this right now. And all it does is it, it expands the government. And we we look at it in a two- or three-year process, and we go, well, it's going to be better for this two or three years. But we're never smart enough to look 100 years out. Just like when uh, the people started the Democratic Party because they wanted right now Andrew Jackson to be elected as uh, president of the United States. I wonder what they would have done if they could have seen 100 years, 200 years later and saw what happens now because of the rise of political parties. Because once the Democratic Party was was set up, then the Whigs came along and said, well, we've got to counterbalance these people, which was about 40 years after the revolution. We didn't have any. But it's because these people want right now. And that's what we have to get out of is our wanting change to happen right now. Let's look to posterity. Look 100 years, 200 years. It might be 150 years and we'll have a revolution or my great-great-grandkids or whatever. And I'm not even – doesn't have to be violent. The revolution, like Adam said, was the changing of people's minds. Maybe 150 years, 200 years. It may be 300 years. Let's fight for that. Thanks for the call, Cecily. 458-TALK is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? This is Josh. Josh, what's on your mind? I think you guys are totally right on the right topic here. Um in the econ, in econ, the concept is called high time preference, low time preference, and stuff. And I kind of feel like right now we're living in an era kind of like if you were an anti-slavery person like a thousand, two thousand years ago. You know, like you were on the right, you could you could do what you could to not own slaves, you could discourage others, but you couldn't really change the system. Like the people were not ready to let go of that evil concept. You know, and you know society moves at its own pace, and we so desperately want to change it dramatically in our short little lives um, to whatever means we can. But um, that's not really how it works. You know, people learn on their own. And these are always social movements and never political ones, like civil rights and slavery. Most of the world government is slavery as a social movement. You know, like people are like, hey, this sucks. We shouldn't do this. This is horrible evil. Um, if you want to see what happens when you do, when you change society with a political movement, look at civil war. Our government forced slavery to go away, and we had a huge, brutal, savage war. Whereas the rest of the world, they're like, ah, this is terrible. We should stop. And a lot, not a lot of people died. So there's definitely a, a better way to do it, and it's low time preference. Yeah. There you go. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate the phone call. 458-TALK is a number. This is Patriots Lament. Who is this? Gordon. Gordon, what's on your mind? Well, I listen to you guys every week, and you degrade the Republican Party, who is opposed to Obama, and then you you make remarks about the Tea Party. I'm a member of both. Uh, I joined the Republican Party when I thought they were headed in the wrong direction. And I went to the meetings, and I've even been a speaker at their annual meeting. And I don't always get my way. I don't. I seldom get my way. But this year we got rid, or last year we got rid of Murkowski in the primary. Now she had three million dollars in her campaign fund, and she raced around the state 
that, uh, and promised all the natives and everybody else uh, benefits and money and uh, favored positions. And she got reelected on the basis of a popular vote over the nominee of the Republican Party. Now, if you guys stood around and you said, well, I'm not going to vote because I'm not getting my way. I'm not going to vote in this election because if Ron Paul doesn't win, I'm just going to sit it out and watch Obama and give him another four years to pack the Supreme Court with leftist judges. Now, you think about it. We just won a property case in the Supreme Court with the Pacific Legal Foundation representing a property owner. A unanimous decision. The first time ever the liberals and the, and the conservative members of the, United, of the uh, Supreme Court voted that this is so odious, the EPA's actions are so disgusting that they overruled the government. Now, what do you think it'll be like after Obama appoints two more judges? You I, won't win anything. Wasn't it? A, you, you just said it was a unanimous decision. Yeah, but that's because Four we have those. half of the court now. Two of those people are going to come up for reappointment. You know what? I, I, I challenge you just to, to look at the voting record of Scalia and of Ginsburg. And compare the two of them, because an awful lot of people will be absolutely staunchly behind Scalia. Oh, look, he's a conservative to the court. And they demonize Ginsburg because, oh, she was appointed by a liberal. But look at their voting record on the Supreme Court. And I think that you are going to find, maybe possibly to your chagrin, that Ginsburg has been a far better upholder of the people's rights well, I, than, than, of, than any conservative justice ever has been. I, I think some ways everybody has... Uh, perhaps some merit that got them recognized. I don't particularly think Ginsburg's voting record on the rights of individuals or property owners is uh, in any way consistent with what the Founding Fathers had. But if you want to believe that, that's up to you. My point in this conversation is to say to you, when you, when you preach opting out, I'm not going to vote, you become irrelevant. Your program is irrelevant. You are already irrelevant because part. all you are doing is you are preaching the party politics of power. No, all you, all you're, I, you're, you're, you're ignoring Ginsburg's voting record and talking about power. You're not talking about the actual point of having a Supreme Court. If, you, if, if her voting record sure. doesn't matter to you, if all hey, that I'm matters a, to you is who appointed her and what party she represents, then you are the one who is leading us I'm all into the path sure. of relevancy. Can I get, can I get my, my uh, point across? Please. Okay. We may never agree, you and I. But at least I joined the party and became a voice for what I thought was reason. I participated. I sent money. I try my best to follow my beliefs with action. You are preaching. Sit on the sidelines and complain loudly and accomplish nothing. I'm exactly you, wrong. You know what? You are you're the one that's wrong because listen to yourself. Now. Listen to yourself. You are saying the exact same line that the people in the Nazi party were saying. No, it's the not. exact same hey. line. At least I joined the party. At it's least I tried to up. advance the cause of the fatherland. When did you go to the party meeting and and uh, Deutschland über alles. Well, I think you I think you have a point. You can. I'm not going to tell anyone. I've been here a lot longer than you're old. That, I th that's don't doubt that. A very bit, true. But uh, I say, if you want to join the Republican Party and that's your avenue to make change, feel free to do that. I am. And, that's and good. what I hate is this imperious attitude that you have that says, "Well, I'm not part of that group." Well, I'm not. The group that's going to make the decisions for the next four years. The, the group that's going to be empowered to make decisions affecting your life for the next four years. That's what it, I'm saying is wrong. The, the, you, want to, we, you want to talk about well, presidency. Our whole point today was the offices of the presidency is too powerful. Let's talk about the EPA. 
the hey. most destructive organization in the United States right now with the most power is the EPA. And guess who gave us the EPA? I agree. Richard and Nixon, a Republican. Replace, if you can't replace some of the senators to get your point across, you will never get your way. Because the guy we've got in there now is making the whole Congress irrelevant. Well, I think a good, okay, here's something for the Republican Party that I think would affect real change. The Alaska Republican Party should try to get um, something started up to repeal the 17th Amendment. And then you won't have Murkowski's going around to the villages offering money to people so they can get elected. Let's or the unions, it was, it was, it, she wasn't elected by the, by the natives, she was elected by the unions. Well, you sit on your hands and I'll go to the next meeting and try. And, and when it all your, collapses, and, and then then they we can blame you as being part of the problem, and then people will look to people like me who said I'm not going to be a Nazi, thank you, as to be part of the solution. Nothing Nazi about the local people in the Republican Party, and that's where you you're coming across as uh, Ann Gorant and know it all, and he, there's never going to be a candidate that does everything you want them to do, and they're going to do it immediately when you ask them to. Exactly. But change as long as you are pushing for the changes you want and you stand up for it. And you're not accomplishing anything. You're, you're preaching, I want to be irrelevant so I can sit on my behind and complain. All right, tell me what the Republican Party has accomplished. What have they accomplished? Hey, we replaced Murkowski. No, you didn't. No, you She's didn't. in office. She won because she had $3 million in... We couldn't mobilize enough people. She, she won because Republicans Republican. went out and voted for her in the general election. She still has Republican in front of her name. In, in the... All right, leave, leave that alone. What else What else have the Republicans accomplished? You got, you got two minutes. What else have the Republicans accomplished? Well, I can't afford two minutes right now because I got a wife that uh, wants to eat, and she's an invalid. So I'll say this again. As long as you opt out, as long as your voice is not heard by the party who will change anything, then you are preaching, I want to be irrelevant so that I can complain and not take any blame. I'll take the blame for a party, but I can stand up and say that I voted against that and I tried to become part of the process, and, and I did. I followed it with my check. Uh, you know what? Big legal. More power to Three you. Three years I've been donating. I to. thought you didn't have two minutes. If you had time to tell me all of this about, again, you could have told me at least one other thing the Republicans accomplished instead of putting another Republican back in that wasn't well, a Republican. I, 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 Quickly, Josh, yeah, we're on, almost out of time. It's fine that he wants to go that route. That's great. Not everyone has to go that route. We're not saying sit on the – how can you say that we are saying to sit on the sidelines and do nothing? Really? No, we're trying to change people's minds to do something that's effective. The Republican Party is, and following that route, is not effective. And you know what, Steve? You're right. Ginsburg, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, has been a lone voice for the Fourth yeah. Amendment. Yeah. With all the rest of them voting in the Supreme Court to destroy the Fourth Amendment. And the one lone voice, we've talked about it on this show before, was that commie, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Right. She voted. She She said bad stuff about our Constitution. Yeah. And but she's been voting to uphold it. Four five eight talk is the number. We got like thirty seconds left. Who's this? This is Maria. Maria, quickly. Uh, Norman Dodd on YouTube talks about how uh, the tax exempt foundations uh, got into the, the public education system. Watch it. All right. Thanks for the call. Uh -huh. All right. We are out of time today. And uh, point of action today would be quite simply. Fear God, not man. <laughs> All right. Contact information quickly, Josh. Uh, PatriotsLament.blogspot.com is our web website. PatriotsLament at gmail.com is our email. All right. That takes us to the end of the show, and we'll be back again on uh, next Saturday morning for the Saturday morning wake-up call at 9 a.m. I'll be back again on Monday morning, 6 a.m., for the Better Breakfast Show. Coming your way next, it's Health Talk right here on KFAR. We are a local talk radio 660 on your AM dial. Fox News coming your way in seconds. Have a beautiful afternoon.